I will admit, I will admit that this is a little bit of a bait and switch for you. Um, I am going to show you some oddities. That's the whole point. But also, the, the, the nice part about talking about oddities in the collection is it lets us talk about um, why we collect and what we collect and how we collect it and why some of these things are oddities from the standpoint of our collection uh, and not necessarily uh, what we tend to do or what we tend to collect. And then I'll run through a couple of these just to give you an idea of why I, I selected these particular items uh, for today. Um, I couldn't help Santa Claus. Um, like all museums, we have a plan. Right? Or like any collector, we have a plan. And our collection plan is, is very specific and talks about what we are going to expend our very limited resources on, right? Money, people, space, right? Uh, on how we're going to collect and what we're going to collect. Um, like any collector or like any person who has a garage, we have limited space, right? for what we can collect. And so we tend to uh, rotate collections in the sense of a nicer piece comes in, a poorer piece goes out. We do that through a very long process that's very technical. We can talk about it later if you want. So we have to constantly refine our collection. We can't take everything that comes in the door, uh, nor would we want to, quite frankly. Um, and what happens, though, is with most museums, and this is not not unique to museums, but this particular aspect is the professionalization of museums, right? People who actually decided they're going to be a professional museum person. That process really didn't begin until the 19, late 50s, early 60s. You start to see programs for museum people, right? Think about Indiana Jones is a great example, right? We think about Indiana Jones as an archaeologist. That's what he says he is. Right? Talk to any modern archaeologist and they hate Indiana Jones. <laughs> Because that's not what archaeologists do, right? That belongs in a museum. You got it. Yeah. Um, so, and the same thing happened in museums. What happened is what was going on was knowledgeable people, people who had a knowledge of subjects, ended up being curators, right? And we actually throw that term around more today, I think, than we've ever thrown it around. People curate websites. I don't know what that means. Um, and the skill set of being a curator as we look at it from a modern perspective, is very different. Knowledge is part of it. Care is the other part. Right? Why you can't touch anything. Go on anyway. Why you can't touch anything in a museum, right? There's, there's reasons for that. So we have these collection, what we call collection management policies, collection needs, and what we're trying to do with all of that is manage how these pieces come in. Now, our association began collecting for its museum in 1971. Um, and it was collecting pretty much anything associated with horology, uh, clocks, watches, time, you, you name it. It came in the door and it became a legal part of our collection, which meant we owned it. Right? The term we like to use for that is accession. Right? We accessioned it. And we accessioned it, everything. So no matter what it was, whether it was you know, clock spring chickens or whatever that is, <laughs> um, or, you know, singing birds, musical singing birds. I'll play this for you, you get a chance to hear that. It's pretty awesome. Um, or, you know, the, you know, they just, everything came in and became a legal part of the collection. So why does that create a problem for me now, right? Creates a problem for you now because you know, I can't just get rid of this stuff, right? I don't need this in my collection. This doesn't fit my modern collection plan. Our collection plan today says we collect timepieces, right? Objects designed and built to measure or keep time, right? That's essentially it. I, I, I'm narrowing it down, but that's essentially what we collect. That's why I don't have a whole bunch of microwaves upstairs, right? They have clocks in them, right? But I don't collect microwaves because they weren't custom made to tell me what time it is, right? So we have to be very careful about how we collect what we collect. Just because it has a clock in it doesn't mean I want it. You got a statue of Santa Claus with a clock in it? Good for you. <laughs> doesn't mean I need it in my collection, right? I may have one, and I do have a Santa Claus watch. But it's not necessarily part of what we collect all the time. And so these pieces, some of these are perfect fits for our collection. I just think they're weird, which is why they're here. And some of these are just weird. 
and that's why they're here. So that's the important part when we look at oddities in any museum collection. I wish I could sit here and tell you we are the only museum that has this problem. Right? Every museum has this problem. If they started any time before 1980, let's say. Or they were started by a small group of people who really had a passion for something. Because when you have a passion for something, there is no Santa Claus clock you won't take. Right? So you take everything. This one piece, I kid you not, I brought down today, came from a gift we received from a, from a gentleman of... I don't know, 500 things like this. Not all Santa Clauses, but things like that. Right? Now, most of the gifts that are, most of the objects that are on this table have been accessioned in the museum collection. Some have not, thank goodness. Um, these will not be. So what happens to it then? Right? What do I do with 400 things like this? Right? Well, what museums typically, oh, I didn't know he had a pocket watch, too. Didn't even see that. Um, double whammy. Uh, what we do with the objects that come in today, again, we're separating that 1971 uh, enthusiast collector for a museum with that 2017 professional collector, which is what we essentially are as a museum. An object like that comes in from a donor. He signs a piece of paper. We talk to them about what they want to do with this collection. And 90% of the time, 99% of the time, we tell them that something like that is not going to be accessioned into the collection because it doesn't meet our collection plan. And just to be fair, our collection plan, our collection needs, what we call our collection needs list, is on our website. Come on. Is on our website. So anybody who wants to see it can see it. So if you want to know what objects it is we actually need, you can see where that is. And you won't see anywhere on that list, you won't see a Santa Claus box list. Box. Because what we collect is designed to fill those gaps as you walk through the museum. Right? Or as we look at study collections. I saved this seat just for you. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. I brought my sweetheart. Hi. So, so the, the whole oddities of the collection thing wasn't going to make the switch because it gives me a chance to just talk a little bit about why we collect the things we collect. But nobody came here for that. <clears throat> when I'm done yapping about each of these, feel free to come up and, and you can take a look at them. I, I selected a handful of pieces that I find really interesting in the collection. I don't even know that the word odd is really what I should say. Um, some of them are odd, but each of them are, are kind of unique and, and and add a little bit to what we do. I have one of these on my desk, actually, in my office. Um, it's from the same collection <laughs> of, of things. Uh, I just can't resist it. Um, we did, for a while, collect horological art. Right? So we have paintings upstairs of well, clocks, and watches, and clock makers, and watch makers. But since, we, since 2009, when we, when we find our collection plan, um, we've really focused on collecting timepieces and not focused on collecting things that are outside of that scope. So the question I have for you is, like, when we've had this discussion before, an iWatch, an Apple Watch, right? We have one in the collection. But the question, it begs the question, is an Apple iWatch a watch? <coughs> Does it fit my collection plan? Because right? what did I say my collection plan was? Custom made built for the purpose of telling time, right? The purpose of that. Does an Apple iWatch fit that description? You can have any opinion you want. I happen to agree with you, Miss. <laughs> but you can have any opinion you want about it. We have them in the collection. And that's what I found funny. If anybody watched the Apple Watch recently uh, that they had, and they said that they're the biggest selling watch now in, in the world or something. But they're calling themselves a watch doesn't make it so. Fitbit doesn't call themselves a watch. Right. It doesn't, just because you call yourself a watch, I mean, you can call yourself anything. Mm -hmm. doesn't make it so. <laughs> so they've chosen to call themselves a watch, and now they're the highest, the largest watch seller in the world. Mm -hmm. But from my standpoint, even though I have one in the collection, keep going back, I don't know that they really fit. But because they're such an important component of our everyday lives today, we act. 
Some of these are not. I'm going to put my gloves on. Don't mind me. Oh, and just for the record, I am actually recording this for the first time because we have it's over here. None of you are seen. It's just me. So whoever's watching this is going to have to deal with this with me. But feel free to ask questions. So we'll go through some of these. Um, for a long time, you know, we, we were collecting things like music boxes right? um, and, and automatons and things like that. But again, were we to collect everything with a clockwork mechanism in it and treat it as a museum piece here, doesn't mean it doesn't belong in a museum somewhere. But here, again, you get into issues of space. So things like singing birds is an early 19th century You want to come up here and see this? You guys are kind of far back. Yeah, no, that's okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, very cool, right? Has a clockwork in it. Works with our gears. Right? We actually have a video of this on our YouTube channel. So. See it a little closer. This this is one of those pieces, right? When you guys can we get a chance to all come up and look at it, you can get do it again. That way you can see it. It's more impressive when you're like where I am. Can you explain to the kids why you're wearing gloves? Why am I wearing gloves? Darn, that's a good point. Thank you. And actually, I'm wearing the I don't usually wear these kind of gloves. Um, I'm going to shut the bird off. <laughs> Um, I wear gloves whenever I handle an object in the collection, right? or even, well, you saw me flicking the bird here, I didn't come down well, but, um, or this thing, but that's okay, it's Santa Claus. Um, he won't care. I wear gloves because all of our hands, I know, and this, Kevin hates this, because he wants to touch everything. It's Kevin there. This is Kevin here. Um, all of our hands, have oil and grease on them, or like you just had a peanut butter and honey sandwich, or, or I, you know, you did something, right? And and so you got something on your hands. So I wear gloves so I don't transfer any of that dirt, that oil, to any of the objects that I'm going to hold or touch today. Right? So that's why I wear gloves when I'm when I'm handling most of this stuff. Now sometimes I can't. I'll tell you a little story. First day on the job here, and I'm a museum guy. That's my <coughs> thing. Put on my gloves, went upstairs to look at a watch. Really nice 18th century pocket watch. Not nice, it was okay. I know now it was okay. At the time I was like, wow, that's a nice watch. But now I know it was just an okay watch. I'll go figure. So I'm looking at it and I go to put my gloves on. And the curator at the time gives me this kind of grumpy look, which I didn't understand at the time. But now I do. Because as I was handling a watch, Lee, you know what happened? It slipped out of your hand? No, luckily not. Oh my God. <laughs> Worse. As I turned it over to look at the movement, right, I flipped it over, the, one of the, the hands got caught on the, in the cloth fabric of my glove, right? And so you end up with problems. So there are times when I wear gloves, and there are times when I don't, right? Because there are certain things, and that's one of the other challenges with, with the kind of things that we collect as we look at this stuff, is sometimes when I'm collecting it has wood in it, or it's just wood, Sometimes when I'm collecting is metal in it, or it's just metal, and all of those things have to be treated differently. Right? They all have to be handled differently, so they don't slip out of my hands, so they don't fall on the floor. You know, usually whenever I have, hold a watch, I hold, you know, we hold it over a table, you know, so that way I don't drop it on the floor. Um, you know, things like that. So that's why I'm wearing gloves. All right. Next little oddity. This one sits on my desk too, because, and this is not accession. Uh, this is a uh, <coughs> six pounder cannonball that's been converted to a clock weight. And according to the cannonball itself, um, it was fired during the Germ that was fired during the Battle of Germantown, during the American Revolutionary War. And it was just a clock weight that's been converted, or, or a cannonball that's been converted to a clock weight. And so I sit down on my desk because it's, got, it's not a clock. It doesn't tell me what time it is. All right, you ready? <laughs> really cool. 
Yeah. It's, and it's, you know, these things are just kind of, it's one of the joyful things of museum work is that sometimes collections don't even know what they have. <laughs> <laughs> right? Sometimes even museums don't know what they have until you actually start digging. Um, and that's and that's one of the fun parts of what we do. And we, did a museum. we did a bunch of talked to a bunch of kids yesterday for our homeschool day. And I always remind them that the only best part about being a museum person is as a kid, and even as adults, although the adults don't listen as much, um, you're always told when you go to a museum what not to do. Don't touch anything, right? And the best part about being a museum person, I get to touch it. So, and odd things come to us, again, not, this is our favorite new box. Um, it's, it's where we keep all of our radioactive stuff. Um, don't get too, it's, it's lined in lead. Um, early watches and clocks, early 20th century watches. Um, used uh, various couple different types of uh, radioactive isotopes to make their dials glow at night. Right? So when you're, you could see what time was on your Big Ben or on your wristwatch, right? So they would add a little bit of that to it. Um, I didn't bring my UV light down, darn it. So we, now, oh, let me cover that up here. I don't like to leave it uncovered very long. Not the authority. <laughs> what you all need to understand is that recently, in the last 10 years, what is, what, what is referred to as, uh, there's a word for it, loose collections of radioactive material like radium, which is one of the most common ones used on watches and clocks, are now regulated by the, by the NRC. So you can only have a certain number of these things in your possession before you have to be licensed by the NRC. So, as like a museum, we have lots of things. We are luckily under the number necessary for licensing. But nonetheless, we have them. As we go through um, some of these things, we actually had these on exhibit not too long ago. All right, so here we go. So these are two vials, each containing uh, pigments that are flor will fluoresce in the dark because they are still active. Right, the radiation in them is still active. Um, you're safe. It's not that bad. Just my advice to you: don't lick it, uh, don't ingest it, don't eat it. But from where we are now, we're all okay. If we were, if we were to leave this out for just a minute and then turn all the lights off and get a pitch black in here, these would glow right, like crazy. Right? And they and they set off our Geiger counter. So we have a little Geiger counter upstairs. Whenever anything of the vintage that we know this was used. <laughs> comes into the collection. Kim gets out the Geiger counter, she swipes over everything, and if it's a little hot, goes in the box. And we've had this box tested by the DEP folks. They're very happy with our box. Um, like even right down to like, these are the pieces of paper that were in the box that the radium was in, all right? That we found the radium to bat vials in. If we run the Geiger counter over the paper, it's hot. Right? It has been all, you know, I'm going to throw these gloves away when I'm done. These are my nice Hamilton gloves, too. Oh, well. So we have to be, again, when we talk about what we collect, I was getting back to what we collect. We have to be careful if a piece like that comes in, right? Or let's say a collection <coughs> of radioactive Big Ben uh, alarm clocks comes in. Well, that would obviously put us over our limit that we're allowed to have under <coughs> current regulations. Um, we have to figure out what we're going to do with that. But then not only that, we have an obligation now to make sure that the owner of those pieces understands you can't just throw those in, your, in the trash. Because once that trash goes to the dump, it goes through a, a, a sensor that senses that stuff. And if it senses it, then the EPA's got to come clean it up. Okay. So even in dealing with folks who have those pieces to offer us, right? We have to keep that in mind as we look at those. So it's not so much an oddity as it is, you know, an issue. But I like the qualities. But yeah, right, you'll find some watches in the 60s. We tend, when we get a piece in, we tend to figure 
if it's any time before 1930 or 40, and it, particularly if it's a military issue piece, or if it's an aircraft clock, or you know, we run it under the guide or counter just to check. Because those things are really high. Santa Claus, we kind of talked about already. This is one of many oddities. I have, I have ashtrays. I have uh, earrings. I have, you name it. If it had a clock on it, we collected it for a very long time. Right? Not so much anymore. This is really cool. Um, horological art. Right, which I guess is what this is. <laughs> I guess that's what this is. Um, folk art, we'll call it folk art, right? Outside my collection plan. Um, you know, we have a number of things that have been created over the years uh, by uh, artists and clockmakers and maybe their wives with the stuff laying around the shop um, that we have in the collection. So. It is really cool. I got to admit, it does. It's like it's like the perpetual motion machine, yeah. <laughs> right? Kind of neat. Um, so there are an assortment of those things. As we look at our collection, right, as we go through our collection every day, um, we do in our business what we call a deaccession. And a deaccession, remember, I said if it's ours and we own it, it's an accept. It's, it's 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 an accession. If we need to get rid of it, that's called a deaccession. That means we need to get it out of our collection because it's this, right? And it doesn't necessarily meet our collection needs. Would it meet a folk art museum's collection need? Maybe. Or another museum's collection need? Maybe. Right? So we'll use it for that. But it doesn't fit ours. And in order for us to get rid of an item, right? in order for us to deaccession an item, it's not up to me. Right? It's not just my decision to make. It's not just our curator's decision. We have to recommend it, so we have to fill out a paperwork and say, this should be deaccessioned because it's a bird, right, made out of clock parts. And then we give that recommendation to a committee of folks who then look at that bird and say, you know what, you're right, that's a bird, and we don't need it in the collection. See, he's still going. And then from there, it goes to our board of directors. Right? And then they decide from that list, can we get rid of this bird? Right? And if they say yes, then we can legally, we are legally at that point allowed to remove the item from our collection and dispose of it. That doesn't mean I throw it in the trash. It means I offer it to another museum. Right? It means I might sell it. Now let's say I sell it. Let's say I sell Santa Claus. Right? What happens to that money? That money comes back to the museum and allows us to fulfill our mission. Right? It doesn't go, you know, to you know, to buy Kevin a nice sofa for his office. Sorry, or a fireplace for that matter. It comes back into the, into the museum so that we can continue to further our mission and to collect the things that we need to collect. Right? Yeah. Did you get saying yes to everything you say? Well, <laughs> that's because that's because he's smart. <laughs> Now, some of the things are, are really pretty cool, even though they're not accession. And that's why and we keep them, because they're great learning tools. So then I can open them. Because some things, we have, we have what's called an education collection, right? And what that means is we have pieces in the collection that we want you to handle, right? We want you to touch them, right? We want you to get up close to them. Right? That's the point of an education collection. And some things just, make themselves really good for that. Um, this is a sample from Hamilton Watch of all the different precision things they could make, right? For their, for their watches, their clocks, their chronometers. And what's cool about this is it's all in Lucite. It's all in plastic, right? So if, I want, if you want to see what, you know, what a gear, where'd he go? If you want to see what a gear looks like, right? You can actually hold it and get up close, right? Because it's in Lusa, and you're not going to hurt it. You're not going to get any oil on it. <laughs> right? You're not going to get any oil on it from your hands or any peanut butter or honey. Right? And that's what makes these parts really cool, because it gives us a chance to let people really get up close and see some of the work. 
start handing them out. I never remember which one they go back into. Sorry. <laughs> so that's what, and that's where sometimes with our collections, a piece might get the accession and we might put it into, right, what we call our education collection. And that allows us to use it for purposes like this. So I can hand that out. People can look at it, you got clothes, you don't worry about cutting yourself, you don't worry about smudging it, ruining it. So it's really a nice way, again, not so much an oddity, although it, these are kind of odd because they're just kind of loosely thrown out there, but a really nice part of the collection that lets us kind of showcase things that we couldn't otherwise do. We're ultimately, these, you're going to see sets of these in, in the museum galleries as well, um, so folks can get a closer look. 35, what are the odds that these are in any kind of order? 35. 32. 32. Yeah, right? <laughs> right. Why do you think Hamilton made those? What? At the time, they're making them to show off the, the, the capability of the shop, of, of the factory to produce pretty much anything of, of specific, intricate design and size. So, and most of these were produced during the 50s, 40s, 50s. So, but I mean, and we actually have a couple that, that, of these types of cases. But it just tells you how, you know, there's sub miniature screws, you know, they're threaded. I mean, to show you the tolerance that they can make. Done? Yeah. 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 You're welcome. Number 37. Number 37. Cams, contacts, and contact wheels for electronic devices. Okay. So anything you need. Large gear and shaft assembly. Well, that was really descriptive. Why am I missing one? Am I missing one? Number 16. Brass parts with blank and cut teeth. Anything you want in the machine. So pull that up. This one's pretty cool. This is one of my favorites. And you're going to think you're an idiot because it's not that exciting. <laughs> If you've been through the museum, and you go upstairs and someone goes to the museum, what you will see are, are these large, and then they scale down atomic clocks, right? cesium clocks. This is the smallest atomic clock currently manufactured right? by a company, a California company called Symmetricon. It is a chip scale atomic clock. Right? That means it uses a cesium vibration, a little laser going through a cesium vibration, uh, to measure time. Tiny. Now, what's the point of these things, right? Why do we produce these things now? Right? The main reason Symmetricom is using them and, and producing them are, there's two purposes. One is they're used by the oil industry. Uh, they put these inside of sensors they drop to the bottom of the ocean, right? So that they're always able to keep perfect time wherever they are, and they, can, and they know exactly where they are all the time. So that's the point of these, these very little energy. The other point purpose of these is not going to surprise you. It's defense oriented. Okay? They insert these into the GPS devices on fighter aircraft or on anything that's in the air, basically. Because what will happen is if there's an electronic magnetic pulse, right, it will kill the timekeeper in the GPS device. And every turn on your GPS device, what does it always say at the beginning? Recalculate. Recalculate. Because it's figuring out what time is it, where am I in relationship to that time signal, right? That's what it's doing. By having these on board the airplanes and the aircraft, it, it never loses that time. It never has to recalculate. Right? So you can't be flying and have to recalculate. That's a bad thing. So that's the fundamental purpose. Ultimately, the company's goal is to make one of these that's a, a quarter of this size. Because you know what they're going to do with it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you know what they're going to do with it? Come on. They're going to put it in a watch. Right? There's already a guy who makes a watch using this chipset. It's a big watch. Big watch. <laughs> Not much bigger than a lot of other watches. But that's one of their goals. So, neat. An oddity. I have, you know, it's funny. We have all these, we have all these atomic clocks in, this, in the storage area. And they're, you know, they're good size boxes. 
And then there's this one that's in an envelope and it's stuck on the shelf next to it. Because that's where it goes. So it's kind of neat. <clears throat> I'm going to end with my favorite oddity. And he's not really even an oddity. Uh, he's just a clock. He actually uh, was one of the many things, a few things on the table that fit my collection. Um, he, and I like this one because it came to us from a longtime member through his son. And it has a really good story. Uh, basically, what you're looking at is uh, a demon of some type, likely the devil. And he's got a symbol in this hand, and he's beating a big bass drum, which is the form of the clock. Now, he originally came with two candelabras right, on either side, which were also little demons, and they were playing violins, you know, and things, and lutes. One was like a lute, one was like a violin. And in some cases, uh, he's painted red, right, with gold highlights. In some cases, he's left like this form. But we, we really like him. He, now, he's lost his way, but that's okay. But it's a form of a clock we didn't have in the collection. Right? So it's an oddity, but it fits my collection name. Right? It fits, fits into the collection. But the best part about it was why we got this clock. I know you're bored. Give me a minute. <laughs> I'm almost done, I swear. The reason we have this clock in the collection is because this longtime member passed away, and his children were dividing up the family heirlooms of his clocks, and he had great clocks. And his son called us and said, hey, we have this clock. Would you like it? And we're like, well, sure, that'd be great. A long time member, great clock, really cool. Why don't you want Because we all hate this clock. Because <laughs> I said, when they were kids, when they were kids, this clock sat in their father's study in his, in, his, in his house. And it scared them to death. So they never wanted to go in there. They never wanted to have anything to do with this clock, ever. So when he passed away, they asked us if we wanted it. And he's creepy. But it's really a very cool, odd little piece of the collection. And I hope that by looking at some of these little odd things, you got a better idea of why we collect what we collect um, and how we do it. And I think that uh, now is a good time to let me uh, let you come up here and take a closer look at stuff if you like.